Hello again. <clears throat> Bill Easterly, I don't think, needs much introduction to this particular audience. Um, so I thought instead of going through his litany of publications and accomplishments, I'd just share a really quick personal anecdote, um, which is that when I was in my early 20s, um, trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life, um, I went and lived for a few months in Guatemala, um, sort of under the auspices of, of volunteering. And I pretty quickly came to realize that it's difficult to be a very useful volunteer when you don't have a lot of um, skills. It's a you know, 22 year old liber liberal arts grad, um, didn't speak particularly good Spanish. Um, and uh, you know, it's fine, like the experience ends up becoming a little bit more about you, which is great, just an important thing to understand. Um, and while I was there, I became very dependent on this little used bookstore uh, in the beautiful Guatemalan city of Quetzaltenango in the West. And I was particularly dependent on it because they had a good English language section and I, I couldn't read the Spanish books. Um, and I was there one day and my hand sort of gravitated towards this book with a really provocative title. And I bought it and took it back to the place where I was living. And um, I was living with a family. I went up and sat on the roof where I could sort of watch this nearby volcano periodically erupt. And I devoured this book. Um, and it was called The White Man's Burden. And it was by William Easterly. And in a lot of ways, uh, that particular book sort of set me on a path of thinking a little bit more critically about development, a little bit more skeptically about development. And the first target of that skepticism was myself. And ultimately, it set me on a path to be here today, sitting next to Bill, um, which is a huge honor. So thanks for being here, Bill. I will very quickly mention um, who you are. You are an expert on the experts. You are a speaker of truth to power. It's come with some uh, career repercussions at times. You're a professor of economics at NYU and co-director of the NYU Development Institute. And according to your own bio that you provided with us, you're the 11th most famous native of Bowling Green, Ohio. So it's a pleasure to have you here today. We should have had the other 10. <laughs> Who is the 10th? The, uh, the most famous is Scott Hamilton, the Olympics ice, ice skating champion. We'll get him next year. How many of you have heard of Scott Hamilton? Okay. How many of you have heard of me? <laughs> Take that, Scott. <laughs> so we're starting with the aid paradox, which simply put is that aid is most effective in the countries where it's needed the least. Aid is least effective in the countries where it's needed the most. Maybe you could explain to us very quickly why that's the case. And maybe you could tell us if you were the president of the World Bank or the administrator of the US Agency for International Development, what you would do differently to account for that paradox. Yes, this is not an original idea. This is an idea that goes back to the great development economist P.T. Bauer from the 70s, and 1970s. More recently, Angus Deaton, the Nobel Prize winner. And the idea is that uh, countries are poor because of some fundamental factors like institutions, a history of Western oppression and coloni colonization, a legacy of autocracy, corruption, violence. And those are the same factors that makes aid not work very well. So if you are giving aid to countries that are most in need, they are in need because of the, some of these fundamental factors that also make aid work not very well. So that's the bad news. That's why us aid critics have such a bad reputation is because we are always seeming to emphasize the bad news. Uh, the good news is it's not, I think P.T. Bauer for one probably would have just said, don't give aid and that's, that's the end of it. I don't think one has to be quite that dramatic about the conclusion. You c more constructively you could say, among the set of low income economies, there are some that have uh, more favorable conditions for aid to work, that have more democratic accountability, like say, uh, you know, Ghana and West Africa is a country with more political stability, democratic accountability, also at a low level of income. 
that could be a country that receives more aid and a, a country that has low income, that has more autocracy and corruption and experiencing violence, that, that would be a country that receives less aid. So you just reallocate aid within the low income category towards more favorable conditions. Which would be easy to do if donors didn't also come to the table with their own priorities, um, some of which are great and ambitious goals like ending extreme poverty. Right. Is that a useful goal, given what you're saying about the fact that extreme poverty exists in the very places where aid is not likely yeah, well to think, work very I well? I think the biggest problem with the, the, the aid community, the official aid community, is that they're driven often by Western foreign policy agendas. And those agendas mean that they often make the aid products worse rather than making it better. So instead of selecting among low-income countries, selecting them countries with the most democratic accountability, it might be more act during the war on terror it was more convenient for, say, American policymakers to give aid to countries that were allies in the war on terror. There were often autocratic countries that were where aid was work less likely to work well, like, say, Uganda was an ally in the war on terror, providing uh, troops to fight al-Shabaab in Somalia and other things. That's uh, that was get a aid to Uganda was increasing by huge amounts during the war on terror because that was convenient, but that was sort of going in the dire opposite direction of making the aid, aid, aid paradox better. It was actually making the aid paradox worse. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about the, the current situation. You know, right now we're seeing a pretty strong merger, I think, of foreign policy and aid priorities uh, among Western donors, namely um, not oriented. Not, not for the first time. <laughs> no. Um, uh, but in this case, oriented around Ukraine. Right. And right. I'm curious how you see that particular um, situation. Is that an exam another example of aid priorities getting skewed by foreign policy interests, in this case, maybe great power competition? Or um, it seems to me that the, the opposite argument might be, no, this is an example of defending those vital democratic institutions, the exact ones that you're, you're saying are, are scarce and um, and critically important to, to make development function. Um, yeah, I mean, it, the problem with that is it's hard for, uh, say, an American policymaker to make that argument consistently. That say to say African governments, now you should side with us and with Ukraine against Russia and don't go to Putin's summit, Russia Africa summit, for example, side with us because we care so much about democracy. And then, of course, you you know, one year ago you came out of, two years ago you came out of the war on terror era where you didn't care about democracy and were supporting uh, autocratic and anti-democratic forces around the world. So it's very hard for, you know, Western policymakers, American policymakers in particular, to be credible about that, that cause of defending democracy, de defending uh, a country being invaded when of course, the U.S. during the war on terror had also been invading Afghanistan, and for partly for good reasons, but partly for foreign policy reasons. Yeah, uh, I just a heads up: we're going to take um, questions in a few minutes here, so please, yes, please, yeah, start mustering them now. We'll have some mics running around shortly. Um, but before we get to that, um, on this issue of priority setting, goal setting, um, big agendas. Uh, when the SDGs were adopted, I remember this really well, you uh, spoke with a DevX reporter and you told them that the SDGs were so broad and encompassing that the acronym SDG might as well just stand for some development goals. Um, we quoted you. <laughs> Do you still feel like these kinds of ambitious collective agendas are unhelpful or even in some cases harmful? Um, and what do you make of the sort of official narrative this week, which seems to be that um, what's needed to rescue the SDGs at this point is to double down on them? Uh, well, of course, the SDGs were already doubling down on the Millennium Development Goals, which were not a success uh, in the sense of actually reaching the Millennium Development Goals. So, and of course, Millennium Development Goals were not the first goal setting, international goal setting exercise. They were in turn doubling down on previous UN goal setting exercises that have been happening for many decades. So at this point, I think we've doubled down on the double down on the double down. So it's getting ever less and less credible that this is really a useful approach to meet goals. Uh, 
Maybe it is useful for some other things. I mean, I think it's, one thing I think it is useful for is just for everyone to get together and agree on sort of what are some things that we're sort of in, f in, in favor of and what are other things that we're against as a development community, you know, representing uh, countries and leaders from all around the world. You know, I, there's, there's definitely good stuff in there. One thing that I like a lot about the Sustainable Development Goals is one of the goals is really that each country should be in charge of its own development. That's one that gets a lot less, a lot less publicity and people sort of just think it's kind of empty rhetoric or hot air or something, but I think it's extremely, extremely important principle in this, an era where we've had too, way too much sort of paternalism and dictation from Western organizations, Western aid organizations towards people in, in poor countries that to just say each country should be in charge of its own development, I think, is a useful thing to have on the table. And that's another thing that was agreed universally as one of the sustainable development goals. The other thing that seems unique and maybe a, a slight pivot from the MDG era um, is that these are universal goals as opposed to development goals for developing countries decided by mm -hmm. UN officials implemented at sort of, you know, this, the level of what constitutes a, a, a basic level of development. Um, these are, are aspirations for, for every country. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about that effort to sort of break down the distinction between um, development is something that happens in the so-called global, global south versus development being something that every country in the world is, is aspiring to do? Yeah, I, I think that is a great step forward and I think that's, um, you know, we have this great embarrassment in our field that we don't have a, a name for our field that it in itself is not kind of embarrassing. You know, we're, it used to be third world development. That obviously was very inappropriate and we got rid of that. Uh, developing is already sort of a patronizing, condescending thing to say, developing countries. You know, it's just, it is, and I think many, many, uh, countries in Africa have protested against that language, you know, understandably. There's just, we just don't have any good terms to sort of divide up the world in in into these two groups, you know, the what used to be called the West and the rest, or the, the first and the third, or the, the developed and the developing. There's just no good labels for that. And why is that? Because the distinct, the, the division itself is not a valid enterprise. It's just not, it's just not a useful enterprise to divide up the world. And so that I agree with you that, that dividing up the world into these categories in which one is inevitably associated with first, developed, uh, west, you know, associated with power, dictation, top down, and the other is associated with, you know, being on the receiving end of all of that. So one is sort of passively at the, at the victim of the other. and. That's, that's the mindset, the sort of colonial mindset that has afflicted us for too long that I think is uh, good riddance to get rid of that one. And then taking that from sort of the rhetorical level to the more operational level um, inside aid agencies, you know, one thing that we're seeing a lot right now, there's a lot of momentum, a lot of discussion around localization. Um, this idea that uh, donors ought to be shifting resources and decision-making authority to communities and organizations based in the places where their programs are operating. Mm -hmm. um, do you see that as in the white man's burden, you draw this distinction between searchers and planners, and you, you err on the side of searchers, who are people who are close to a problem, who can solve it and then be done with it, as opposed to coming up with sort of broad scale plans and importing them from the top down. Mm -hmm. Is localization a, a an answer to that criticism? Uh, I, d I definitely agree that it's a step step forward. The, I the concept is very good. It's not, uh, you know, how do you implement it in a way that still it's USCID choosing who is going to be the local representative of, of local communities? That's really the problem with it. I'm, I remember, um, you know, and this idea has really been around for a long time, civil society, uh, and uh, those words have been, have been part of the lexicon of development for a long time now. I remember seeing a picture of a conference uh, on Afghanistan, a development conference on Afghanistan, and there were some you know, Western officials with name tags, and then there was this, I saw a picture of um, what looked like a person from Afghanistan with a, his name tag just said civil society. 
I thought that was so like dehumanizing. This is sort of like anonymous civil society. Uh, not a name, not a qualification, not an individualism, individual re recognition. Uh, you know, that's, that's such a violation of dignity. And so it's so important to have this process of localization be something that really does shift power away from the aid organization itself towards uh, people who are seen and recognized and respected as representatives of their, of their, own, their own community, of their own bottom-up efforts. Great. Well, let's go ahead and take some questions. We've got mics floating around. I see one question there. If we want to take a couple at a time, or we'll, we'll start with that one, and then others can um, summon their courage, and maybe we'll take a few more. And let us know who you are, if you don't mind, as well. Sorry, I'll just Oh, you're behind the TV. Yeah. That's OK. <coughs> Hi, my name is Silvana Sinha. I'm the founder and CEO of Brava Help, which is a for-profit healthcare company in Bangladesh. And I met you 20 plus years ago when I was a student at Harvard, um, getting my master's in devel international development. And I'm also have been a longtime fan of your work. So thank you for being here. Um, my question is about, you know, as I, I started my company as a for-profit company because I really believe the only truly sustainable form of development is private sector development. Um, but I can't tell you how many investors have said to me, it's such a shame, you're doing such incredible work, I wish I could give you a donation, but I'm not ready to invest in Bangladesh. Um, and this includes the likes of, I mean, and the gates of the world are not investing in the markets that they've helped to bring to middle income status like Bangladesh. So how do we convince um, global investors to understand that there's huge both financial and impact opportunity in these markets now that they've, you know, they're no longer really, you know, at the bottom of the pyramid, low-income countries. Um, that's a great question, and I, I've heard other other entrepreneurs from other countries g g voice very much the same complaint, and it's very it's very sad that that's happening. Um, and I think I don't know if you I'm interested if you would agree with this that part of the problem is that the the aid narrative, you know, put out by official aid agencies and NGOs. Uh, so much stresses kind of the need and the poverty, and it, it can it can lead to a very kind of stereotypical vision uh, view of poor countries as being, you know, only involving the poorest of the poor. You know, usually the pictures are of children. You know, so it's a sort of infantilizing picture of children and the very poor. And then it's hard for you know Gates or someone else to visualize that country as being a a place of dynamic adults that you want to invest in, uh, that the dynamic private sector led by you know very capable men and women, and that's I think that's part of the problem. Do you do you agree with that? Or do you have a different view? Yeah, I, I think that's part of the problem. I I think the Gates they're probably not the best example of that. Though I think they they've been a big part of Bangladesh's growth story. I think particularly on the healthcare side, they've invested in primary care and vaccine distribution, all are which are things that that have helped Bangladesh to you know achieve tremendous progress on social development indicators and economic progress. So I I think that perhaps there are other billionaires who don't have that kind of an understanding, but but I think it's unfortunate that even those who do are still not <laughs> investing their private capital in, in these countries. But absolutely there's a marketing problem and you know the you know the um, the, the the media doesn't make money off of showing people who are suddenly using toothbrushes and eating healthy food and living longer lives. Um, of course, DevX is not not responsible for that, but I think I think that there's an element of that. Certainly, a lot of people still think Bangladesh is is the basket case that Henry Kissinger called it 40 right. years ago, even though right. it's growing at 68 percent. And when you have a country growing at 68 percent a year, you see the progress. And even a bad financial return is better than what you can achieve on average in other markets. Right. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Yep, right in the front here. Do we have another mic? Oh, thank you. Well, no one else was brave enough to put their hand up, so I thought I would. Thanks for jumping in. Um, my name is Marek Pashevich. I work for a very small NGO called Together for Girls, which works on um, the prevention of violence against children. And it's very data-driven, very evidence-based, very locally owned. Why is it that there are some, probably all, 
issues and the SDGs are very large, there seem to be proven interventions that, that help, and yet they are still not adopted. Is it simply political will? I'm sorry, what are you saying is not adopted? There are, in health, in education, in the field I work in, there, there appear to be proven interventions mm -hmm. that have been measured, shown to succeed, mm -hmm. and yet they still don't get adopted. Why is that? Do you have one in particular in mind? Or any, well, any examples? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the field I work in now, um, the protection of children and reductions of violence against children. There are there are proven interventions, parenting programs, for instance, mm -hmm. that, that that work that have been independently measured, mm -hmm. shown to reduce violence against children. And actually, the lead countries, the countries who have done most in this area, are uh, mm -hmm. in sub-Saharan Africa, Kenya and Eswatini, are, are mm -hmm. two good examples. Mm -hmm. So why is it that these things don't get adopted elsewhere? Yeah. Well, the the simplest answer is. Uh, you know, there's also politics. <laughs> politics determines which things get uh, adopted. Um, but I, I want to make sure that that's not a misleading answer because uh, the answer is not to like try to do away with politics and have some beautiful technocratic world run by technocrats that do all the evidence-based policy interventions with no, no constraints to stop them from doing the proven, proven interventions. Uh, that that's not the answer, certainly because. You know, the po uh, this process of democratic accountability is w and private sector accountability is itself what leads to these good policies, these good solutions. So you, you can't just step aside and say, you know, put the experts in charge. That's likely to make things worse because experts don't understand all the, the local contextual factors that make something not, s not work when they think it is going to work. Yeah, hi, Bill. Um, I'm uh, Martin Fisher. I run um, Kickstart, and we promote smallholder irrigation across sub-Saharan Africa. And I'm just curious um, what your thoughts are about Give Directly that we just heard uh, a very strong pitch for. Give Directly and, and direct cash transfers generally, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, one, one of the few upsides of being very old is you uh, you have a long memory about what things uh, have looked like in development over time. It's, uh, you know, it, it's kind of surprising that a couple decades ago, the idea of unconditional cash grants was just like a, you know, so beyond the pale, so extreme that anyone would, would even think of recommending unconditional cash grants to poor people. And now it's become much more, much more accepted. And I, I think that is a very positive trend. Why was it so abhorred uh, you know, a, dec a couple decades or even one decade ago. And uh, I think it also has a lot to do with uh, sort of paternalism, that uh, you want to control what poor people spend their money on because you don't really trust them to spend their money on the, the right things. So you want to sort of force them to uh, spend the money on what you think they should spend it on. You know, uh, Esther Duflo and Abhijit Banerjee have a, a great story in, in their book that they met a man in, in rural Morocco who was telling them that, that he, he you know, lacked enough money to put food on the table for his family. And, and it seemed like a very sad story going on in the, as they were talking with him in that household. And then they went in, he invited them into the house and he, they saw that he had a, a, t a television and DVD player and an antenna to pick up you know, television signals. And um, they said to him, um, y you know, you said you don't have enough money for food. How can you, why don't you spend money on food instead of television? And he said, you know, my family wants television more than food, <laughs> which we, we r people in rich countries don't, don't understand, but we also spend lots of our money on things that we don't really need that instead of, you know, taking care of our own health or nutrition or something, we, we spend money on frivolous, inefficient things. So I, I think the sort of respect for the autonomy of poor people, that poor people do have a life. You know, they're not just, they have a life. They, 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 want f they, they invest a lot in weddings and funerals and, you know, other, other ceremonies that, uh, that carry, give them a sense of dignity. And so 
And part of, part of a sense of dignity is, is agency, autonomy, being in charge of yourself, you know, and ha having the right to make your own choices, not have someone else to tell you what to do. So on that, on that glorious cause, I think uh, unconditional cash transfers are kind of a small step forward for that, for that great cause. Well, Bill, thank you so much for the provocation that you've brought here today, that you've brought to many of us for many, many years. Um, thanks for joining us and for engaging with the audience as well. Please join me in thanking Bill Easterly thanks for being here. Thank you.